Welcome to The Lawyerist Podcast, a series of discussions with entrepreneurs and innovators about building a successful law practice in today's challenging and constantly changing legal market. Lawyerist supports attorneys building client-centered and future-oriented small law firms through community, content, and coaching, both online and through the Lawyerist Lab and Accelerator. And now, here are the co-authors of The Small Firm Roadmap and your podcast hosts. I'm Laura Briggs. And I'm Stephanie Everett, and this is episode 285 of the Lawyers Podcast, part of the Legal Talk Network. Today, we're talking with Jenny Blake about making career and life pivots. Today's podcast is brought to you by Belay, Back Office Betty's, Text Expander, and Case Text. We wouldn't be able to do this show without their support. Stay tuned. We'll tell you more about them later on. So Laura, today I thought we might talk a little bit about community and why it is important for business owners to have the right community around them. I completely agree. I think you not only need to have a community, but you need to ask those specific questions to figure out how do I figure out which community is right for me and how do I interact in the right way? Do you have suggestions around how attorneys should look at this question from the big picture? First, it's obvious. Yes, you need a community. You need help. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, in lab, we offer coaching. You're a coach, I'm a coach, and we have other coaches that connect with people for these one-on-one conversations. And that's great, but we don't have all the answers all the time either. And I think sometimes what our labsters, newer labsters kind of figure out is there's a lot to be gained from your peers and from being with each other and really having cool, deep conversations around how are you doing that and what's working and what's not. And I think the what's not is often the more powerful part of the conversation. Yes. And I think that it's easy for us to go into sign up for any coaching program or mastermind and think, I want to leverage as much as possible out of the one-on-one access that I get to these experts. But don't forget that your peers are also experts too. What I've seen is that sometimes during the different group events, whether it's LabCon or a mastermind or office hours with our labsters, they get just as much out of hearing other people, the way that the other attorneys phrase their questions or talk about the way that they've approached a solution to a problem. And so we love helping our labsters one-on-one, but don't forget about this great community that you can build around you as well to learn from their experiences. And sometimes the biggest takeaways that you have are, you know what, I never thought about that problem in that way until I heard this other person talk about how it's affecting their firm. Yeah, I couldn't agree with that more because I often hear people come away and say, I didn't even realize I had that problem. And then I heard somebody else ask about it or bring it up and it totally resonated. And now I see it differently or I see how I was suffering from that too. And I didn't know it. And so that can be very powerful. What's also important is, and we kind of started to talk about this is making sure you're in the right room with the right people. And what I mean by that is people who are going to approach problems or approach the practice of law, or in our case, how to run up the fact that you're running a business in a similar way, because there's nothing more frustrating than being in a room of people and hearing things. And unfortunately in the lawyer world, this still exists, you know, like, Oh, why should I be on the cloud? Right. Let's just take a ridiculous statement. Like when you're in the room with that person, if you're trying to build the future forward client centered law firm, that's very frustrating. Yes, the right community can push you forward, but the wrong community can hold you back because we like to think of our communities as places where people can brainstorm and talk about different ideas and share their experiences without saying, oh, I have the definitive answer. And so it can be really disheartening when you finally say, you know what, I think I might have a challenge and here's how I want to present it to my community. And then people shoot you down and tell you, oh, you're thinking about that all wrong. That's not even worth your time. I tried that and it never worked. That can keep you stuck. And so the people that you surround yourself with, that's a really important decision that you need to think proactively about how am I going to surround myself with people who think about the practice of law and the business of law in the same way I do, that we're future oriented, that we're willing to ask difficult questions, that we're willing to try to push each other forward rather than focus on some of the more negative aspects or bad experiences that people have had, because it's really disheartening and frustrating to go through that kind of experience when you feel like you're trying to use people as a sounding board and all you're hearing back is 
that you're getting shot down on every front. And we really strive to make sure that our communities are future focused and solution focused with each other. Now we've got a brief sponsored conversation with Trisha Shortino from Belay, and then my conversation with Jenny. Hey, everybody. I'm Trisha Shortino, the CEO of Belay. Belay is a staffing organization, a 100% remote staffing organization. And I've been with the company for 10 years, leading a 100% remote organization focused on delegating so you can do what only you can do. And that's such an important point. And it's one that lawyers really struggle with, especially our solo and small firm lawyers. So can you talk a little bit about the mindset and what you have to think about as you're coming up on delegation itself as a topic? Where do you start with that? Yeah. I mean, you start with recognizing you can't do it all, which for all of us is a a hard place to sit. You can, right? You can do it all. You can work 80 hours a week. And you're going to land in a place of burnout. You're going to land in a place where you're wasting time and energy, spending hours on low transaction, low ROI items. And you might also have some repercussions on how that suffers as it blends into your personal life and spending too much time working and it taking away from the time you're able to invest in your family and your hobbies and things like that. So we really, really believe to be the best leader you can be delegating and doing what only you specifically can do is so important for you to have maximum health, for you to work normal hours, to get out of the grind and live truly your best life. So we are a huge proponent in evaluating what it is you can stop doing and someone else can do it for you. I love that spin on it because we often think about delegation as getting more of your time back so you can do more things at work, but it really allows you to have that nice balance with your life too. I think a common place where people get stuck is, okay, I recognize I'm doing too much. I'm working too many hours. How do I figure out what are the things that I should outsource to somebody else first? Yes. So we have put together something for you guys today. We have put together a delegation matrix, and we're going to share that link with you later on today. This matrix will really be a great first step for you if you're really not clear on what you should stop doing. It's a good little exercise worksheet you print out and go through that will allow you to really create grids and rows of the things you know you must do things you know, somebody else who had a great skill set could do, and then the things you like and enjoy you want to keep, and the things you dislike. And once you go through that delegation matrix, it will become pretty clear to you where to start. You will have a really good list of the things that you don't like, and you're not great at, and you know you don't need to do, and then you can start there. That's the perfect starting point. And I think it's also where a lot of our lawyerist lab members tend to get stuck. They feel really overwhelmed by the steps that come after recognizing what the tasks are that you can delegate. So can you talk a little bit about taking that list and kind of transforming that into a job description? Yeah. Well, so there's two things. You have this great list and you can go in two directions. You can say, okay, is there somebody else on my team in my office? Is there anybody else I work with? If you are not solopreneur, that could help with some of these items, likely administrative. The second thing is, do I need to hire somebody? So if you get to the place where you say, okay, there's nobody around that can help assist with these items that I need to get off my plate, then you're probably in a position where you need to hire somebody. And that is when we talk about creating a really good job description. So the job description is a great area to spend a lot of time really cohesively thinking about what this person needs to do for you. Soft skills, hard skills, the practical work, but then how you need them to show up for you as well. Getting it on paper, there's so many templates out there you can use to create a great job description, for whatever that role might be to support you. How do you know that you're hiring the right person? Because you're likely to probably get a lot of responses if you write a great job description. Yeah, so that's one of the things we love doing at Belay. (laughs) We receive (laughs) thousands of resumes every month and only hire one to 3% of the people that we work with. So we have honed in on how to interview and vet people for hiring. Think of hiring as a pretty long process. 
You're going to go through your resumes and pick the cream of the crop. There will be some quick yeses and nos to filter through. From there, you're going to decide who you want to potentially send some pre-interview questions. So this is a good one for a lot of people. Don't interview every single person or every resume that you think looks great. Send them some pre-qualifying questions. Ask them to send you a video. You can get a great evaluation of somebody. If you ask them to answer two or three questions in video, you can determine from there if that person is valuable or comes across in a fashion that you would like to actually interview that person. Once you've done so, consider multiple people around you interviewing them as well. We believe that more than one opinion matters, more than one interview matters. And then when you've done multiple interviews, put them through some sort of skills assessment. Give them some sample work to do. Let them prove their skill set matches what they say that it is. Perfect. If you're ready to get started and need some ideas to get those creative juices flowing, Belay has put together a list of 25 things that attorneys specifically can delegate. You can get a copy of that at belaysolutions.com slash lawyerist. Thanks so much. My name is Jenny Blake. I'm the author of Pivot, The Only Move That Matters Is Your Next One, and host of the Pivot Podcast. I am so excited to chat with you because I think if there's one word we've heard over and over again since the pandemic hit, it is the word pivot. And you've been talking about pivoting for a long time before that. So that seems like a good place to kick off. Can you speak to whether or not you think more people are thinking about pivoting in light of everything that's been happening in the world recently? Oh my goodness. Well, absolutely. It is the word of the year. It seems 2020 is the year of the pivot and we've all gotten pivoted. That's what's been so wild about this pandemic is that as a planet, it's as if somebody took the snow globe of the world and shook it up. And even still, all the little particles haven't settled yet. We were all asked to pause, stay home, learn about public health and safety and reconfigure and think about our businesses, our jobs, our careers, our interactions with others. I mean, we are all getting a black belt in pivoting this year. And it is fascinating as somebody who has been studying this. I started working on the book in 2013 and it launched in 2016. The motto I created when I was working on pivot is if change is the only constant, let's get better at it. Mm. And I knew that the nature of reality is that change is the only constant. If there's one thing we could bet on, it's that things are not going to be the same tomorrow, a year from now, five years from now, especially with the economy accelerating the way that it was even pre-pandemic with globalization, automation, outsourcing, the pace of innovation. But I don't think any of us could have anticipated the sense of daily unyielding change that has been happening during this time where there's really no ground to stand on. We've all heard this phrase, the new normal. There's no new normal. (laughs) It's different every day. And I think it's going to be like that, honestly, for the rest of this year, which I don't think anybody saw coming as we entered this decade with all this hope and optimism of 2020 vision. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, we might be getting it, but in a very different way than we expected. And it feels like a lot of that 2020 vision has really shifted to, okay, I'm just going day by day now. I'm not going to try to plan a month or two months in the future. We're going to go with this a little bit smaller. So I think one of the things that's happening for a lot of people and some of our audience as well is this extra time at home, whether it's because you're not commuting or you've just had to rearrange your business in a new way, it's making a lot of people think about what they're happy with in their life. So they might have been going at a frenetic pace before the pandemic and are now realizing, hey, maybe there's some things in my job or where I'm at with my career that aren't perfect. So how do you really know when you've hit a plateau in your career and that it's something that you should take seriously and think more on? Yeah, I love this question because oftentimes our pivots or pivot points or plateaus come as a product of our success, that whatever we were doing or attempting to do worked. And actually it's a sign that we've outgrown our previous career or business incarnation. So one of the ways you can tell you're at a plateau is a just general lack of enthusiasm. You're not necessarily springing out of bed anymore for whatever that thing is, your role or your business or even a creative project. Also the sense of challenge isn't quite there. I will say that with the pandemic, we're all getting challenged in a very big way, emotionally, 
with time for a lot of people working from home. If you have kids, it's even more difficult. We're being challenged in terms of our health concerns for ourselves and our loved ones. So there's a lot of challenge right now that's not even coming from our work. But it's also asking us to pause and say, wow, with so much intensity, so much stress, so much challenge going on outside, what am I willing to put up with in my work? What is going to work for me moving forward? And even things that might have seemed really shocking in the moment. I know many people have been furloughed or laid off or you've lost big streams of income. I certainly did. It's also been a very interesting time to pause and say, what of that was I truly enjoying, was really energizing me and making me feel alive? And how much of your work is draining or just even neutral, where it's not giving you energy, it's taking it more often than not. And that's really how I would think about a plateau. And pivoting is hard for anyone, but I think there's an added element of it when you own your own business, which essentially most of our audience are small firm and solo attorneys. And so they do own a business. And so it's almost like you created this thing. And so it's harder to step back and say, you know what, this version of what I've created here with my business is no longer engaging me or exciting me the way that it did. Is it a little bit harder to do those pivots when it's something that you previously felt so connected to? Yeah. Well, this is the blessing and the curse. The blessing is that you own your own business, yay, (laughs) or you're part of a small, very agile firm. And then the downside is that you're responsible and it's all on your shoulders. And maybe you're not just in charge of the business and your team, but if you're a breadwinner, even on the home front, it can feel like there's a lot of pressure to just keep things going as they are. Don't rock the boat too much or it's all going to fall apart. And I've certainly had those fears myself. On the other hand, what I find so empowering about being a business owner is that I know for sure that I love being my own boss. I love having my own business. I think it's a very creative process to be in. For me, it's been almost 10 years now of full-time self-employment. So the good news there is that for so many of us, we're probably not going to pivot, like close the business or go get a full-time job again. So then in a way, I find it kind of empowering that the overall container is still there, but now you just need to look at the different slices of the business and say, you know, I talk about piloting in the book. So small experiments to help you test a new direction before you go all in. So maybe your pilots are going to be looking at your past clients. Who do you actually love? Many of you have probably heard the 80-20 Pareto principle. 80% of your revenue comes from 20% of your clients, or even 80% of your joy comes from 20% of your clients. So who are your favorite clients that you love and adore? And how can you double down? How can you find more of them? Or in your business of your pivot portfolio, all the streams of revenue coming into the business, which ones are the most profitable and the most easeful and the most joyful? Sometimes they'll even draw this as a two by two grid and I'll actually map out all these activities at the intersection of revenue and joy. So which are the ones that produce the most revenue with the most ease and the most joy? And maybe you're going to pilot doubling down on one of your streams of income or dropping one of your streams of income in the business that isn't providing as much fulfillment. Maybe one of your pilots is going to be in terms of internal systems. Maybe there's a certain team structure or bottlenecks in the business that are sucking the life and the joy out of what you're doing. So there's a very creative opportunity here, which is to not make the big capital P pivot, but to look for these smaller pilots to really say what is working well and how can I double down on that as I build in the next direction. And for some of you also, if we're talking about the legal profession, maybe there are certain types of cases and clients or content that you work on that you really love. And then other things you're ready to move on from, even if those have been lucrative for you in the past. I find over and over again that if I go with my energy and my intuition, good things will happen, even if I don't know upfront what that's going to look like. So that sense of ownership is actually something that's a positive because as the owner of your own firm or business, you have the ability to step back and say, okay, what are the data telling me here about what I like and what I don't like? And how can I use that to figure out what we're going to offer and who we're going to work with in the future? So you don't have to work with everyone and you don't have to work on every project. And it's a good reminder as a business owner that is often a trap that a lot of business owners can fall into is thinking, well, there's a client, there's a project 
that's a revenue generator, so therefore I should do it. And there's so much more that goes into that decision. So when you come up on that idea of, okay, I'm feeling the need to pivot and start doing some of these pilots, is it ever too soon to start telling other people that you're thinking about this? Is there a certain you know milestone that you should hit before you start telling, say, your clients or your loved ones or your friends, hey, I'm thinking about making this change? New ideas, or I think of them like an eggshell. They are fragile at first. It depends if you're telling people to get their permission. You're kind of secretly wanting their approval to move in this new direction. Or if you're already clear, even if you don't know how it's going to turn out, they're not going to affect your decision as much. So I do think there's something beneficial about running it by only trusted advisors who are going to encourage and nurture your new ideas and also give you valuable feedback early on. I wouldn't be sharing these ideas yet with people who you know in the past are quick to point out what's wrong, what's not going to work, what's going to be difficult about that. And in terms of communicating with clients, I have always loved and benefited from being very transparent along the way. So only you can know what's right for your business and your community, but there's a lot of relief when you as the business or the business owner share in an authentic way What are you thinking about? What are you experimenting with? And by the way, it's quite exciting. If you're going to pilot a new type of project or service that you offer, some of your clients may jump at the chance to get in as kind of founding members or founding clients of this new idea that you have. And they're going to find that exciting and also inspiring to see that you and your firm are continuing to grow and evolve, especially now as we're all being asked to do that. You can be the leader in that way and set the example. And some pilots might also be about streamlining and making things even easier for you and for your clients. So it might not be that the work itself changes that much, but there are certain parts of the process that are very inefficient or that drag you down or that create a lot of extra hassle for your clients. So maybe there's a new piece of software that you're going to try out that actually is in service to them. So I think what happens before communicating any new idea is what one of my clients calls a listening tour. So you can go on a listening tour. And I even had one of my friends put this publicly on her podcast. She said, here's my Calendly link. Book me for 20 minutes. I want to hear what's on your mind during this time. And you could certainly do that with your clients so that before even deciding what's next or sharing that out, you're actually listening and hearing in their own words, what's on their mind, what do they need? And what would be most beneficial? I love that because it's not just all about you. It's about thinking about those other people as well. And I think a lot of us suffer from this feeling that you're going to be judged by other people for stepping back or walking away from something that maybe those people perceive as valuable. And I don't know if this was your experience, but many pivots ago, I used to be a middle school teacher and it wasn't necessarily that I saw the signs leading up to the fact that that was not going to be sustainable for me. It almost felt like it smacked me in the face. One day I was just like, nope, this is not going to work anymore. Do you have any advice on how to tune in to some of those red flags and feelings sooner on so that it doesn't become this thing that hits you all of a sudden, or maybe that's just the way it is that it hits you all of a sudden. I'm curious about your insight on that. Yeah. Well, I love hearing your story and how you pivoted. That's a big one. Yeah. (laughs) Someone said to me, this was in the context of relationships, but they said, isn't it interesting how once you've had that big aha realization, you look back and all the yellow flags turn bright red. So true. So what were, (laughs) yeah, like all these little things that were yellow flags in the moment where you thought, huh, is that weird? Or is it just me? They turn red when you look back after that big revelation. And I love your question, which is how do we get better at noticing those yellow flags and honoring that earlier on? One thing that helps me and a big mistake that I see pivoters make is conflating listening to their gut or hearing their intuition and then having to know what to do about it or having to communicate it. So let's say I'm going to use the relationship example, which of course applies to career too. Deep in your gut, you know, this isn't the right relationship or you're ready to move on. But you almost won't let yourself even hear that intuitive hit because, oh my gosh, I can't even imagine how am I going to end this? When will I going to say it? How are they going to be upset? Okay. And all the laundry list. The same thing in our business. If there's a whisper in your gut saying, this is not the right client for you, or this is not the right direction. Listen before you even know what that means. So allow yourself. It does take courage to hear that thought. And have it be scary and have it be like, no, come on. I can't possibly let go of that type of business, you know, or whatever the message is going to be. 
and just let it exist. Let it be a question where instead of saying all that could go wrong with this intuitive hit with this, what this information is bringing you, you start to ask, huh, I wonder how that would work. How would I start to make this shift? What would that look like? And don't even worry yet about how to say it publicly. That's last. And I find that often we get intimidated and we confuse or cloud our own thinking by worrying, what are people going to think? Or what are they going to say? Or will my clients be upset? Or will my family think I'm crazy? And none of that is helpful when it comes to actually listening to our intuition in the moment and in the first place. Perfect advice. We're going to pause to take a break to hear from some of our sponsors. And when we come back, we'll be chatting about how to actually lean into that pivot. Support for today's episode comes from Back Office Betty's, the only virtual receptionist service exclusively dedicated to small law firms that offers a plan with unlimited calls. Their highly specialized service boasts customized call handling, relentlessly friendly team members, and unmatched quality. The Bettys are ready to help you grow your firm, even when you're out of the office. Visit backofficebettys.com slash lawyerist to try them out for one week free. Use the promo code PODCAST to receive $150 off your first month. Typing the same thing like your email address or phone number over and over is a productivity killer. Turn everything you need to type more than once into a snippet with Text Expander. Type an abbreviation you make and your snippet automatically expands. Text Expander works everywhere you type and helps you reduce errors and increase productivity. Text Expander is also available for companies so you can share snippets with everyone on your team. Text Expander is available for Mac, Windows, iPhone, iPad, and Chrome. Show listeners get 20% off their first year. Visit textexpander.com slash podcast to learn more. Looking for a true alternative to LexisNexis or Westlaw? You could save thousands this year if you switched to Case Text. Over 6,000 law firms from solos to 40% of the AM Law 100 use Case Text to help them find better results in less time and for less money. For $65 per month, you'll get access to 50 state and federal case law, statutes, and more with zero out-of-plan fees. Try the Smarter Legal Research platform. Lawyerist podcast listeners can go to casetext.com slash lawyerist to try Case Text for free for two weeks. Okay, welcome back, everybody. We've talked quite a bit so far about recognizing those early signs of pivoting and kind of coming to terms with it yourself. I think one that's challenging, especially for anyone who's an entrepreneur, is this perspective on shiny object syndrome. So how do you tell what's a distraction versus what are those early calls for needing to pivot? Yeah, I love that you said shiny object syndrome. And I've been thinking a lot lately about I call it sailing the sea of shiny shoulds. <laughs> so there's shiny objects, which are things you might be excited about. Some people are love new ideas. They love ideas. They just don't love seeing them through. And those I think would be the most susceptible, let's say, to shiny object syndrome. And then on the other side, the sea of shiny shoulds. Those are all the shoulds that dangle, that look shiny. They look sexy. They're like, oh, well, imagine if you, I don't know, went this direction. And I find both can be distracting. I look for a genuine sense of delight. So if it's just a shiny object, it's almost sometimes I think we look for something to save us or something to provide relief on the current situation. And it becomes a shiny object because let's think about this in a consumerist construct. You know, we could say, I'm so bored at home with this pandemic. What can I buy? And maybe one thing you're going to buy is genuinely life-changing. Like I actually caved and I pandemic purchased a Peloton, but it's the best thing because it's getting me to exercise and improve my mood every single day versus buying random things just to try to soothe the discomfort of being at home. Things that are just going to create clutter in the house. The same can go in our business. And then there are also activities that you're just genuinely joyful and you, you can't explain it. Like for me, it's podcasting, just like you, Laura. I love it. It brings me so much joy, but it takes the most time and it's the least profitable in my business. However, I'm always looking for what are the intangible benefits or what are the second level benefits that are coming in? So even if I don't have sponsors or top line revenue from the show, what other parts of the business can and does it support? 
And so I'm going to take a podcasting course. I love software and I love systems. I'm going to take a course on a new piece of software called Notion, which is blowing my mind right now. So I like to follow my energy around what really delights me and also what I know matches up with what has brought me joy in the past. And it's always a little nerve wracking to invest time and money in a new area, but I've always benefited from taking those small risks along the way and then seeing where they take me. And I think we could all ask ourselves that you can even ask, is this a shiny object or is there something truly sparking joy here? And what would be the benefits of me going this route or taking these steps, even if it doesn't pan out in a typically successful way, however you define that. That's perfect because not everything has to pan out. I think sometimes we put this pressure on ourselves of, okay, well, if I do invest in this course, if I do spend the time learning this new thing or talking to somebody who's in another career field that I think I might be interested in and it doesn't pan out, that's a loss, right? And it's not always a loss because some of those questions and those activities that you're taking part in are leading you towards your ultimate answer. And so they don't always have to be the right ones on that path. I know you mentioned that one of the things that's most dangerous that you could do when you're trying to figure out what your next step is, is when you just straight out say, I don't know. And I think for a lot of people, they feel that there's something wrong. There's something off. They want to take that next step, but I don't know is that gut reaction. So can you talk a little bit about how do you move beyond that initial, I don't know, but I know it's not this. During the pandemic, I shifted to daily podcasting for three months and now I'm back to Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And I did this episode, I was on a dog walk with my dog Ryder, and I recorded an episode from the park, totally informally, called I Don't Know. And I just riffed (laughs) on, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to podcast about next. I actually would love to hear from you because I'm at an inflection point and I don't know. And sure enough, as it always goes, this ended up being one of the most popular episodes that I've done (laughs) this year. And people keep commenting and there was something comforting about maybe that permission or just the admission that sometimes we reach a point where we don't know and we need to ask for help and input and feedback, especially from the people that we're trying to serve. So it was actually very freeing and helpful for me to say that. And then many people did fill out the survey, my listener survey. When it comes to pivoting, and even when, let's say you hire a coach or you're working with somebody, when you say, I don't know, as a coach, I always, and I share this in the book, I always like to say, what if you did know? Or just try or make a guess, you know, what does your gut say? And whenever I ask, what does your gut say? And someone says, I don't know. That's where I challenge. I'll say, sit with it, close your eyes, get into your body. Really? What does your gut say? And if they really get into their body out of their head, you can almost see the thoughts swirling in their head, start to settle. They settle into their body. There's always something there. There's always a next clue that their gut is whispering something, even if it's something you don't want to do anymore. And the empowering feeling of just saying that out loud is what will start to open those doors to what's next and just take the pressure off that you have to have all the answers up front when you're pivoting. That's impossible. And especially now, this is the great equalizer because none of us have any clue how to navigate a pandemic or if what we're going to do is going to work. So we're In a way, we're actually all in the same boat. We're all in this together. We're all fumbling around and none of us have the answers. So isn't there something freeing about that? And there's absolutely something freeing about the fact that you're saying, hey, you have some of these answers, even if you don't have all of them, but you have to slow down and really think about it and listen to your intuition. And I think part of that too goes back to The fact that it's so easy for all of us to fall into the path and the routine of doing, 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 and we miss those yellow flags along the way of things that maybe aren't aligned, but we never really stop to ask what that next step would be. And that's why that I don't know gut reaction is so simple to go to because it's like, well, I don't know. I know something's wrong, but the easiest thing for me to do in this moment is answer that I don't know and hope that somebody else has those keys for me to figure out what that next step is, but you actually have them yourself. And Sometimes that can come from sitting and thinking about it or talking it through with somebody else. And I think that's really powerful for our listeners to think about. 
Another challenge that I imagine comes up with pivoting is there's also just the reality of the situation that if you're in a position where your pivot has to do with your job or your source of generating income, you are going to be exposed to income gaps. And you talk in the book a lot about shifting your mindset out of scarcity, because when you're trying to pivot and also have in the back of your mind, but if I even explore this route, I might be giving up my source of money and revenue. Can you talk a little bit about how do you move yourself from that mindset out of scarcity to the one that is more focused on the opportunities in front of you while balancing the reality of needing to generate income? Yeah, I love this question because there's so much fear right now as a baseline around our livelihood. And then in general, whenever we're making career business related changes, it does seem to threaten our livelihood. So there's inherently more fear than we might have just picking out what to wear or even where to live because our career provides for ourselves and our families and our lives. So what I noticed when I was leaving Google back in 2011, I was obsessed with this fear. What if I fail? What if I end up in a van down by the river? What if I go broke and I lose my savings and I have to sell my house and my car? And you know, I just, the list went on. I realized my tendency to create this movie about the worst case scenario gives such a megaphone to the fears. I thought, well, all right, I can't really make the fear go away. That's going to be there. But what's on the other side? What's the other possibility that could happen? And I started to ask myself, what if I leave Google and I earn twice as much in half the time. So every time I had the fear, what if this all falls apart and I fail? I would ask, well, what if I earn twice as much in half the time? And now 10 years later, I've adapted that to become an ongoing question in my business. How can I earn twice as much in half the time with joy and ease while serving the highest good? And that orienting question helps me stay focused on the how of doing that with joy and ease while serving the highest good so that I'm not only obsessing over the fear and the scarcity and what could go wrong. And I think we're so creative, you know, humans as a species, we're so creative, especially business owners and entrepreneurs. Creative problem solving is your jam. Resilience is your thing. Like being able to ride economic dips is in your skill set, you already have the tools and the resources to solve these problems. So why not you? Why not earn twice as much in half the time with joy and ease while serving the highest good, even during a pandemic? Like if we just at least allow ourselves the possibility by asking that question, that already will open the door for that outcome. Whereas focusing only on what could go wrong and what might break and how we save every last penny may just keep our focus there. And then we're not even opening the door to the abundance that could come in if we set our attention there. That's so interesting because we often only think about those what if questions as being a negative thing. What if everything falls apart? What if I lose my job? What if I don't have income? What if this is a mistake? But what if questions actually go both ways? It's just like you said, what if this was an opportunity to make more money in less time? Or what if this was an opportunity to serve and impact more people? And so that's a simple mindset shift and reframe that everyone can use to start thinking about how you can pivot six successfully. I know you talk in the book about some of the different levels of learning and some of the things that you do after you are piloting some of these early ideas as you're pivoting. Can you talk a little bit about what makes for a good pilot and learning opportunity as you're kind of just dipping your toe into the water of moving towards a pivot? Sure. Yeah. So pilots, again, think of a pilot episode of a TV show. It's one episode meant to help a network determine if they should pick up the full series. So as you think about business pilots, a good pilot will help you test three E's. Do I enjoy this area? Can I become an expert at it? And is there room to expand either within your company or within your community or the market more broadly? So as you think about pilots, and I mean, just look at the restaurant industry during this time, they've been pivoted in really dramatic and drastic ways. And in so many cases, heartbreaking ways, but in order to stay afloat, these restaurants have had to do pilots, like experiment with simplifying the menu, doing delivery only, or pickup orders only, or offering free drinks, you know, or takeaway cocktails here in New York City. I mean, there's all kinds of creative things that these restaurants are trying, and they don't know 
what's going to keep them afloat. But certainly if they don't try, if they don't do anything differently, that's just not going to work because of all the restrictions in place. It's been very interesting seeing how different restaurants are responding in different ways, given the resources and the interests that they have. So there's a lot of talk that even in the fine dining space, maybe fine dining restaurants that have always been very resistant to doing delivery or pickup orders may start experimenting with that, that maybe people are going to do fine dining from home, which there may be certain chefs or restaurant owners that say, I don't even want to be part of that. I'd rather not be open than serve that kind of client or business. But then there are others that are going to find that to be an interesting creative challenge and possibly a new trend that's happening in the fine dining space. So that's what those pilots are for is just to help you see, does this work for you and your team? And do you want to do more of it? And that way you don't bet the farm. You don't take out a whole second mortgage, put everything you have on this one new idea and then pray that it works. That would be too much pressure. And most of us, myself included, are too risk averse to do something as dramatic as that. So that's why these smaller pilots that feel stretchy and edgy, but still safe enough to try, that's where I would really put your focus and attention. We so often hear language today like dream job, perfect position, uh, this is what I've always wanted to do. And the reality is that very few people end up in something that defines perfect for them for the rest of their life. And I think that's one of the things that I took away from your book is that a pivot is not a once and done thing. It's something that might come back. And sometimes even the speed at which it comes back at you can be shocking because you're like, I just pivoted last year. Why, why am I feeling the call to pivot again? So can you talk a little bit about sort of embracing the idea that this is an ongoing process rather than something where you're like, cool, I found the dream thing. I'm good. I can do that for 20 or 30 years now. Well, that's what I think this year 2020 has shown all of us, which is there's no there there, <laughs> as they would say in the Buddhist communities, that <laughs> the big secret about pivoting, and I share this in the book, is that we're always in a continuous pivot. And in fact, the people who are the most agile and the most adept know that they're always pivoting. There's always a pivot in progress. And I was laughing as I started to work on this book in 2014, 2015, and I would tell people what I was working on. Every single person I encountered would say, oh my gosh, you're writing about pivots. I need that book. Oh, I'm in the middle of a change right now. Oh, I'm about to pivot. I could really use that book or they know a friend or a family member. And so I learned that there was nobody that wasn't pivoting. I mean, that's a double negative, but it's like everybody had a pivot on their mind. Everybody felt that they were heading into a change or coming out of one. And so that's the big secret. And the better we get at this process of looking at and doubling down on what's working, creating a vision for what success looks like, and then looking for pilots and small experiments, the better we get at that process, the less jarring these pivot points become. And even now during 2020, when there's no solid ground to stand on, we can see that as soon as you think you've figured something out, the world is going to change again and the world is going to keep changing. So all we can do is keep dynamically adapting and adjusting while leaning on our biggest strengths and the things that are truly at the core of ourselves and our businesses that will provide that steady foundation that have been the timeless foundation in the past and will continue to be into the future. And that goes back to something you brought up early in our conversation about if change is inevitable, how can I get better at changing? So keeping that attitude going forward, I think is really helpful. Well, Jenny, thank you so much. It's been a delight to get to speak with you. And I know I've learned so much from you already and our community will as well. Thank you so much, Laura. It's been a joy to be here. Thank you for having me on the show and big thanks to everybody for listening. The Lawyers Podcast is produced by Laura Briggs and edited by Christopher Ng. Are you ready to implement the ideas we discuss here into your practice? Wondering what to do next? Well, here are your first two steps. If you haven't read the Small Firm Roadmap yet, grab the first chapter for free right now at lawyers.com book. Next, if you're looking for help beyond the book, then let's chat about whether our coaching communities are right for you. Head to lawyers.com slash community to schedule a 15 minute call with our community manager. The views expressed by the participants are their own and are not endorsed by Legal Talk Network. Nothing said in this podcast is legal advice for you.